Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's like to be here. I am, I am as ecstatic as most of our listeners know. I love having newbies on. We got a podcast version today, folks, uh, introduced by a common friend. Jim, give us a quick background. I know you're in Chicago. Give us a quick one to two minute overview of your origin story. And then we're going to get super weird and deep. All things Vol. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, born in London, uh, lived in Turkey as a child, uh, moved to Texas after that and kind of grew up in the uh, state side, educated here. Parents were in Norway, went to prep school on the East Coast uh, at Andover, uh, kind of got a real interesting look at the world early on and got to travel a lot. Uh, always interested in math, econ and public policy. And that kind of took me down. Uh, a derivatives trail. Went to Rice University for college, studied math, econ, and policy there. Uh, and then natural landing place after college was Chicago, um, knowing I was interested in, in derivatives. Uh, started in market making land uh, in the S&P 500 equity options in 1998. Um, trial by fire during the tech bubble. Um, moved up the chain pretty quickly given my background and was fortunate enough in 2003 to leave and start a uh, big market making um, operation for uh, a prior specialist firm, uh, Bear Wagner Specialists out of New York. They were looking to diversify uh, into the market making world and we built a you know, 25 person operation for them. Um, and eventually in 2006, I left and started my own market making operation. Um, good timing. Uh, right during the you know beginning of the financial crisis in 2007, uh, we became about 13% of SPX volume during that time. Was became a big uh, player. We played uh, across equity indexes as well as ETFs, but really equity vol. Um, and really cut my teeth uh, during that time. Um, really built out um, some some new uh, trend following stuff and some some structured trades um, eventually sold my stake in that business in 2010 uh, when I had like 95% of my net worth in it and uh, started a GIA capital after a, a year and a half of kind of enjoying the fruits of my labor uh, in late 2011. So uh, GIA capital has been around, like I said, eight and a half years. Uh, we trade uh, volatility products, uh, mostly uh, algorithmic quantitative approach. Um, our, our flagship product is a uh, long vol. Um, it has been, which was a, has been a, a slog, as you'd imagine, uh, starting in late 2011 until recently. But uh, we have kicked off uh, north of 10% alpha a year um, with uh, positive returns, long ball um, throughout that whole period. So um, that's the, I may have gone over two minutes, but that's kind of the or, origin story. And, Perfect. And uh, kind of brings us to today. You know, you and I would have overlapped at one point at Rice. I was only there for about a week. I was a super nerd oh, really? in university. No, no, well, I, I went to a tissue engineering conference once there as an undergrad. You guys were known for a big uh, biotech uh, program there. But I just said, it's too damn, it's too damn hot. I, I couldn't take it. I had spent all the time indoors. It was too hot. I think it was in the summertime. So, uh, all right. So, Interesting, because you cut your teeth in a few different market environments. You mentioned, you know, starting your firm about the same time we started ours, prior firm in 06, uh, right before the financial crisis. And then you've had this pretty mellow period since. Um, talk to me a little bit about AGEA, though. Uh, that's what we'll, we'll kind of focus on uh, some of the ideas. Uh, what, when you say long vol, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So give us sort of an overview of the strategy, the process, what that means to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we really take a, uh, a focus on uh, long ball in uh, both the VIX and uh, equity index land. Um, we do look at a couple of other products, but we're focused on equity ball. Um, we really believe based on um, extensive research that that the peak uh, has for 40 years been in 30-day uh, in vol, um, even though long-term vol is theoretically um, higher and, and, and skew uh, extended is theoretically higher, um, the actual structural, structural demand uh, kinks the 30 days. So we, we actually try and focus on capitalizing on the inefficiency 
um, and relative uh, peaks in, in the ball, 30-day uh, ball, and look at hedging that with uh, tail products, both in the VIX uh, call wing, um, as well as uh, you know, some other uh, dispersion trades, depending on the ball environment. Um, yeah. We, yeah. I'll keep going. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was uh, going to say, so we, we also, you know, we, we look to, uh, we really have a, a machine learning quantitative background. So we're kind of out there uh, really studying different environments, what's happened long term, what's happening now, but we're, it's informed by, you know, uh, 20 plus years of, uh, of experience in these products and how things have moved. I think we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, so maybe tell me a little bit about, um, I mean, you don't have to give away the secret sauce, but maybe any just general examples of what a trade may look like or what a strategy may look like, uh, just so people can have a broad understanding of what you guys um, might be doing when you're talking about some of these, some of these ideas. Yeah, so uh, without going too deep, uh, you know, we're essentially looking at uh, the peak of, of skew in domestic um, indexes is, is generally in the monthly is about 30 days out. Um, we are looking to, um, to monetize uh, that, that skew um, based on a, we basically take a distribution of, uh, of market events based on different, um, different market environments. Um, we uh, look at the potential moves underlying the, the, in that ball environment, scale the strategy, and then look at the volatility surface um, across both ETFs, uh, single list names, as well as uh, the VIX, and find uh, not just what's high and low on the curve, but what relative to potential outcomes um, sticks out. Um, we then uh, structure a trade uh, based on our, our tools and proprietary um, uh, technology that allows us to uh, you know put a put a position on that is long tails long vega uh, within a band has a very structured um, position and shape and uh, has a positive expectancy um, over that period um, relative to risk return so we're really you know we're really approaching it from a uh, you know the idea being that there's always uh, opportunities on the curve based on supply and demand dynamics but but uh, intrinsically structuring it with with tail and convexity and so what's the actual products you guys are trading is it uh options on etfs options on indexes are you mixing in futures etns what's the toolkit yeah um all of the above um the the flagship is obviously the uh, spx um options over the SIBO as well as the uh, e-mini um options over at the merc um, but we also trade the fix uh, futures, uh, VIX calls uh, and puts the options on the, the VIX as well as uh, all the ETFs um, and uh, you know larger equity options um, as well. We've traded some structured products um, over the counter, but we keep that uh, to a minimum. Um, we really think uh, liquidity is um, is key when you're being long volatility. We want to make sure that uh, you know we have the ability to monetize. Um, appropriately, um, and don't want things marked against us. Um, so, and and you're not trading any other markets. You're, I assume you're not you're not trading international uh, equities or fixed income or commodities or anything else. Is it mainly focused on U.S. Uh, sort of concepts? We're we're focused domestically. Um, we do obviously watch uh, and uh, look at uh, both Euro stocks as well as Nikkei and Kospi, um, and those factors feed into our, our models. Uh, we also, one thing I didn't mention is we also run a uh, CTA trend following strategy um, proprietarily. Um, this is not kind of for public consumption currently, but uh, we, that trend following strategy is, uh, you know, does and the factors that, that it produces feed into our ball strategies as well. Um, so it's not just uh, vol R, but it's also looking at, um, Know, directional components and and what makes that one unique is really it's ball indicators uh, we're looking at um, uh, ball indicators across the board of what where supply and demand dynamics um, are imbalanced at what points and how that uh, you know helps uh, indicate price direction um, generally on a daily weekly and monthly level we're not uh, very high speed you know high frequency but but those vol indicators have always been great really at a nice edge um, to CTA trend following, and what we've discovered is over really the last eight years, their efficacy has has exponentially grown as well. So, 
And, um, and so on the vault arb side, like how, how active is this? Is this something that like you're updating on a minute by minute, hour by hour? Are you doing daily? How long do the tra trades last? Is this something the short term, long term? How's it kind of the position sizing, risk management all work, all work into the, uh, the book? Our distributions that we look at are uh, five days or so weekly. Um, so we are forced to rebalance um, at a minimum weekly. Uh, but for the most part, uh, our average hold time is a day and a half. So the mm -hmm. trades rebalance um, quite quickly based on market environments. Obviously, in a low vol environment, they're going to rebalance slow, more slowly in a higher vol environment uh, more quickly. Um, you know, our rebalances are driven by uh, losing implied volatility uh, as well as um, market underlying movements. Uh, and they're really focused on kind of delta skew points and making sure the trades are balanced on a risk uh, to profitability kind of metric. So, um, you know, it really is uh, making sure that, that everything is constantly uh, optimal relative to slippage um, and making sure that we're, we're in the best part of the curve at all times. So um, before we get into some of the regimes over the past number of years and, and decades, perhaps, uh, any other ideas like when it comes to the actual portfolio and strategy that, that I'm glossing over that when you're talking to institutions or investors, you know, one, maybe like, where does this fit in? How should people think about a strategy like this, but also any other mechanics or things that I just, I, I missed out on before we uh, sort of skip over to some other uh, ideas. Yeah. Um, look, this is uh, meant to be a, you know, five, to 10% of a, a portfolio. Um, a, it's non-correlated to pretty much every single other product um, out there. It is a, a, by definition, a tail and convexity hedge um, that, uh, that you can put in your portfolio for uh, you know, structured alpha. Uh, if you look at a long uh, put um, you know, out there that generally historically has yielded south of uh you know realized ex expected value of that over the long period is 10, 10 to 20 percent negative per year of scale to capital um we're kicking off about 10 percent alpha um on average over what has been a very really low ball period so um, being able to add that into your portfolio is not only important on a kind of beta adjusted basis but more importantly um you know having that that tail exposure that allows you to um you know buy in times of stress, not liquidate parts of your portfolio uh, at the most opportune times. And I think that's really the big argument here that people miss a lot of the time is, is if you, you know, why have that tail hedge, uh, you know, in, in the portfolio, it's, it's not just, you know, especially if you can, you can sit on poor performance for, for, you know, relatively long periods of time. And, and the answer is to, to obviously be in a position of strength when things are at, at their most, um, you know, so, desirable right. to buy. When's this sort of strategy work best? When's it, uh, when's it face headwinds? So we've, uh, the best performance for the strategy in the last uh, eight years has been August 2015, Yuan devaluation. We obviously uh, made about 30%. Um, uh, February 2018, a similar number. And obviously uh, March of this year, um, you know, we had a peak of about 50%, up 50% for the month. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it does well, not only in big uh, kind of moves, but uh, you know, if and when you get to reach, we haven't really get a secular move, um, like in 2008, um, you know, to the downside, it has actually its best performance. So it does have a tail component, but it also um, does quite well. And, you know, this month and last month will be a good example um, in a trending market as well, uh, trending down market. So um, it's, uh, you know, I think, it's, it was informed by a lot of my greatest successes, which were in 2008, 2009, as well as kind of dot, uh, dot com bubble. So, um, you know, it is, it will do very well month after month um, in, in by taking advantage of a structural inefficiency that increases during those times of stress um, and ultimately will pay, uh, you know, dividends month after month. Um, so tell me a little bit, downturn. tell me a little bit more about that comment. Um, you know, structural inefficiencies in markets often uh, don't exist. They're, they're hard to find, or you're taking advantage of something, um, whether it's behavioral, macro, technical, tax related, people being idiots, whatever the category is. 
what, why does this sort of approach continue to exist? What is the structural inefficiency? Anything more you can say on that uh, point? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, there is um, a heuristic in vol markets, I would say, um, where people, um, money managers, don't want to buy long dated vol um, for the most part. They see it as a, um, you know, a, a drain on, 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 you know, month after month uh, of cost. They also see theoretically as long dated vol as being, um, for lack of a better term, kind of the, the highest kind of uh, implied volatility is the high, highest uh, skew. And so there is a, uh, there's a natural inclination to, um, to not buy longer dated vol and to buy one month vol. Uh, that, mm. that allows them to hedge dynamically when they see fit. Uh, they also don't want to manage a, a, a big structured position with longer ball versus shorter ball and rebalance it on a constant basis. So uh, people will, money managers will jump in and, and buy puts when they, they feel it is best. They're also, um, because this tendency, which has been there for, like I said, 40 years, products have developed around these tendencies like, like the VIX, right? Uh, to help support uh, buying of that kind of dynamic 30 day ball. Um, and so all of these factors force demand, which ultimately, you know, if you're ever looking for an inefficiency, a structural inefficiency, it's going to be a supply and demand imbalance. Right? And there's a massive supply and demand imbalance um, in 30 day vol. 30 day vol tends to be um, overbid um, and you have extended supply and, and, and in the back of the curve uh, historically, not just because of a lack of demand, but you have sellers of, of uh, on, a, on a delta adjusted basis, delta sticky skew involve a longer data, whether it's an institutional manager like, uh, like Warren Buffett or, or Curl Icon, um, but you have, you have sellers out there um, uh, or CTAs that, that just like to sell that stuff. So you get this kind of uh, kink in the curve, I guess I would say, and it's not just a visual kink, but uh, relative to um, expected outcomes. Uh, I think an important part here, which I'll go down a little bit of a rabbit hole too, is people like to look at this stuff theoretically, and you may get some arguments back on this that, oh, it's, you know, longer stuff is still theoretically more expensive. I think the important takeaway here is the longer out you get, there's a liquidity premium that should exist. Um, like you see during, like you saw during long-term capital uh, management, um, other crises, um, the longer data you go, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, realized versus implied vol that matters. It's really a function of supply and demand. And uh, longer dated vol ultimately has a tail on it uh, to, the, to the long end, especially during a secular down move like we saw in 08. Um, and, uh, you know, owning that stuff uh, is, you know, can be, you know, you have limited downside with, with big structural upside on the tail of, of how that can perform. Whereas one month ball is ultimately going to decline into expiration, expiration that is um, immutable. Um, and, uh, and you're able to hedge gamma effects of that uh, 30 day ball into that decline with, with shorter, dated, um, uh, shorter dated options and, X and ball. So um, there's a way to structure these trades where you can get long vega, long skew, um, collect um, kind of decay, have convexity and do it in a way where you're, adva you're taking advantage of, of the kind of the, some of the structural mispricing that exists. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's something, like I said, that's worked uh, for a extended period of times and, and the inefficiency, if anything, has increased uh, with, the, you know, with the increase in demand for ball products the, uh, you know, and, and the introduction of products like the next. So you've existed and survived, which is a compliment we often tell people long, in our world for a long, long ball manager it's something yeah. through uh through long vol but also through a few different totally different types of crisis um i was smiling as you were talking about secular bear markets and trends and as i was going to say what's that we haven't seen one of those in a while <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. But, but talk to me a little bit about have there been any different I mean, obviously there's different environments. I mean, 2017, the market went up every single month. Um, and then you have things like this year, which is totally different. And then the financial crisis and you highlighted a few different months. Um, what, what is sort of like vol and liquidity over the last 10 and for you, you feel free to extend it 20 years because you've been doing this sort of for a while. What's changed? What's been the same? How do you survive certain periods of fallow and famine and everything else in between? Um, any general thoughts? 
yeah, it's changed a lot. Uh, I think I think anybody who's been in this market for 20 years has 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 seen um, a dramatic change in the way these markets work. Um, there are structural dramatic changes, um, primarily driven by the Federal Reserve and, and increased liquidity. Um, you know, uh, vol compression um, really starting after the tech bubble uh, with with you know lower interest rates um, and in response to that liquidity crisis. Um, have crushed risk premia, um, risk premia in all terms, not just uh, volatility products, but uh, you know, credit spreads. Um, I mean, I don't tough to tell most of your, um, you know, people listening to this podcast, but you know, you have uh, the massive increase in carry trades, um, you know, lack of li liquidity premium in products, um, and uh, and that crush that crushing or, or uh, I guess. That, that reduction compression of risk premia has led to a very different market. Um, there is, uh, you know, a, um, a, a move, I would say, um, there's a feedback loop into kind of markets without risk premium uh, compressed. You are, you're essentially create markets like in 2017, which I think is really kind of the, the best example um, where implied volatilities are historically lower and realize volatilities as a, as a result are lower than they've ever been in history. Um, and, and that's not a coincidence that the feedback loop of low risk premia leads to everybody being long gamma, uh, everybody essentially, uh, you know, and, and hedging uh, much shorter periods. We didn't move greater than I believe 3% in 2017 to the downside. Um, and, uh, you know, as kind of proof positive that there is a feedback loop, I think 2017 is a great example um, 2017, we saw also historically the lowest correlation in equities uh, by 20%. And again, uh, not a coincidence. So, so why is that? You know, if, if implied volatility is compressed. Um, you know, and the index, and the indexes in particular, whereas which is where all the uh, compression happens uh, from volatility selling. Uh, you know, there's still idiosyncratic risk. Um, you know, at the end of the day, markets. You know, uh, single stocks will move based on uh, coming up with a cure or better earnings or um, you know, some idiosyncratic issue. And when one stock goes up, you know, another stock has to go down if the implied volatility is the risk premium is compressed. And so um, there's actually, you know, a lot of people think it's the other way around, that like correlations were the lowest they've ever, you know, uh, uh, the lowest they've ever been. So implied volatility was compressed. Uh, you know, we have a strong belief based on history that that the opposite is true, that risk premia being compressed has really led to uh, structural changes in the way these things move. And so you have a much, you have much lower realized volatility uh, locally than you've ever had um, relative to history, um, but uh, bigger, faster, more um, you know, painful moves um, that happen on the tails. So essentially all um, you know, all liquidity has been moved to, to local and, uh, you know, the moral hazard and the Fed being in the game uh, has, has essentially led to um, bigger and more uh, painful tales. Um, so uh, that's the biggest change in the markets. I think that, um, you know, uh, is, is probably uh, the biggest change. There have been, you know, big changes based on that and how the implied volatility surfaces of equity options have you know, move, they, they, they don't move the way they did 20 years ago, um, particularly skew in these products. Um, you have, um, you know, longer dated skew, um, really getting compressed uh, into down moves um, and, and really going to higher highs than it's ever been. The range has dramatically increased relative to history. Um, you know, the, the idea again being that secular moves uh, are, uh, are not in the data set for the last 20 years. Um, and what works, um, you know, based on uh, automated models uh, and, and, you know, passive investing is, is to sell the longer dated vol and skew into a drop in the market and buy gamma protection uh, that allows you to uh, lever into vol selling and essentially leverage buying of the dip. Uh, these, these trades work uh, and have very high uh, sharp ratios. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as you're, um, creating a, a strategy that, that cuts that tail, um, 
you know, when it needs to, and that's based on a lot of assumptions that you can do that. Um, you know, selling the, that vol and skew into a dip and, and buying it back when, when the market's uh, rallying is, is, is the way to keep short vol and to keep collecting that premium. That, that has completely changed the structure of how these volatility services work and move uh, and changed a lot of uh, strategies that work, um, that used to work. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, I think, you know, and this is a big kind of issue that we can talk about as well is, you know, if that liquidity were to ever change, right? If, if the federal, if interest rates were to no longer be penned near zero um, or were, you know, to actually come off that level, um, you know, the implications for this market and the way it moves and the ability for a secular decline to happen, I think um, dramatically increase. I think the Federal Reserve knows that, I think, um, but, but uh, you know, there are very few, uh, points in, in these data sets that people are running, uh, you know, and trading these products that, that points to that. So um, I, I think if anything, that makes it even more dangerous and, and more likely that, that, that a change in uh, monetary versus fiscal policy, which we may be facing here um, going forward, um, could change kind of the movement and, and way that vol and risk premium products are, um, are trading and can make a, a, have a dramatic effect on, on, um, on, on what happens in the next uh, you know, four or eight years. All right, I got I got a lot to add. Uh, questions, um, you sure. know, I, I, how much um, input and the struggle I always have with markets, of course, is is this time different. Being able to try to figure out, you know, how much is a structural change and how much is just business as usual, you know, you reference long-term capital um, and such a great example on a lot of levels of this. Um, how does that, how do, how do you sort of manage that process over the years? I mean, because um, there's so many different levers. You mentioned some of the put selling uh, and, and just vol selling strategies and how much impact that may have, how much of it's fiscal, how much monetary, how much you know, something just getting pushed one way. It, I guess part of my question is also just how much of what you're doing is just purely algorithmic and how much have you had to change and adapt over the years? Yeah, we've had to adapt a lot. Obviously, uh, you know, when we, the, the, the first 10 years I traded are, are, are very different than this world. Um, I think it's important though to have that experience. Um, I think a lot of people managing money now don't know what it was like 20, 30 years ago, and what another market looks like. I think the increased, you know, financialization, automation of, of um, you know, of a lot of these prop uh, books, a lot of these, um, you know, passive ETFs, ultimately, um, most of that's based on data for the last 20 years, which is a very, in my mind, historically uh, unique environment. And there's, uh, you know, you have to respect uh, the reality of the last 20 years and, and, and position yourself accordingly, but also be prepared that, uh, especially given where we are, um, uh, both in terms of policy and, uh, you know, politics, I think is important as well, that things, you know, interest rates could very well um, move higher um, and, and, and go back to what would be a, a completely different regime that, that had, had very little to do with the last 20 years. Um, and again, I think the leverage in the system, uh, not just leverage um, in, in traditional senses, but leverage in, you know, all of these uh, risk premium products, which really increase into extended moves like we saw in March, um, really create a dynamic, um, especially if it were to ever be a secular move, um, because again, if, if something like March happens and it's quick, and you're able to, to save and not mark uh, to market certain products and have, have losses come back, um, things are okay. But if you have a system where uh, long people in longer dated, um, you know, volatility, I think a great example is 08, you know, we saw um, 10 year vol, which makes no sense, you know, in a, in a rational sense, go uh, to north of 60. Um, that doesn't make sense. Nobody thought that 10 year vol would be uh, 60, right? But they leverage in the system create a situation where people had to buy it back at those levels. And, uh, you know, just like, you know, in, in 
you know, in 2006, prior to the financial crisis, 10-year vol was, uh, I believe, running at around 13. Again, ridiculous, doesn't make any sense, but, um, you know, these, the feedback loop in these markets can do crazy things. And so um, add to that the amount of leverage that's in the system and the amount of how big these positions are now across the money management space, uh, you know, embedded into uh, structured products. Um, you can really get a situation where um, the effects are uh, almost untenable for an entire economy. Um, and so I, I, not to be, you know, Dr. Doom or, you know, I think, I think there, are, there are real, um, you know, aspects uh, of, this, of this market that, that are built on a lot of assumptions and they're recent assumptions. Um, they're based on, again, data sets that uh, are, are not particularly relevant for uh, longer term time frames and different regimes. And, and I think we're entering a time now in particular where, you know, at least the perception at the very minimum of a potential change, uh, you know, given potential fiscal policy and potential inflation, um, you know, could really change uh, kind of the liquidity dynamic that has really supported a lot of, of the trading and help performance of certain strategies. I was going to use the more technical phrase, shit's going to get weird, but uh, <laughs> I, I figured um, we'll, we'll keep it uh, just pretty, you know, um, pretty basic vernacular. Um, yeah. Jim, talk to me about 2020. You know, you mentioned 10 year vol blew out. Um, was this year too quick? Did it happen in March? Uh, maybe walk us through just kind of what, the, what this year has looked like so far. Yeah, so this year, um, again, uh, a lot of, very little has been talked about how 2000, so March happened and, 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 and how it ended so quickly. I mean, uh, the bottom, um, you know, ha really happened right at March uh, expiration. It's a quarterly expiration. Uh, derivatives played a, a, a significant role in, in the liquidation that happened at the bottom. Um, it, uh, it has really in every you know, since 2015, at least every major uh, downturn, um, all of them have uh, been resolved, though, with Federal Reserve liquidity um, and, and uh, you know, greater and greater amounts that have been necessary. Obviously, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about how the Fed's pushing on a string and it needs greater and greater uh, medication to solve the, you know, the uh, metaphorical illness. Um, and, to, and, and the idea there is by increasing liquidity is to allow these risk premium trades, really. And that's, that's what nobody talks about that much, to not get out of hand, to not get, allow the mark-to-market losses and, and these uh, credit spread losses and these vol, vol product losses, structured products, uh, on and on, to, um, to snowball to a point uh, of a lack of confidence in the system. Um, the problem is... Again, uh, great, you know, you can continue to support this market and not allow it to decline, but at some point, which has happened over the last 20 years, it's a long time, creates a moral, moral hazard, A, um, so people are, systems and, and, and programs are set up to take advantage of this and assume that tail uh, has a lower probability than it actually has. Um, and, uh, and they're also, you know, forced because of the compression of the yields and these risk premia to, um, to really um, you know, because of a scarcity of potential yield, obviously there's that you know, Tina effect where it, it leads to even more selling and more compression. So you have a, a leverage system with uh, more selling because of a, a fear uh, of missing out, uh, a lack of uh, potential other option scarcity paired with a moral hazard creates a massive system that is self reinforcing. And if you ever have a system where liquidity disappears, the effects are um, you know, exponentially worse than they ever were. Uh, Federal Reserve knows this, um, but there's very few ways out. Uh, and I think the reality is if, if they really want inflation, if that's what they're talking about now, right? Uh, I think, you know, not enough ink has been spilled on, on the effects of inflation and how it can unpin uh, the risk premium trades that have been supporting um, all of this leverage in the system. I think that's an unintended consequence that's not being explored and thought about uh, by the Federal Reserve and by many market participants at this point. Um, again, higher interest rates, a lack of delevering of the system um, is, uh, you know, is ultimately at these, uh, given the way the system works, given the positions that are out there is incredibly 
uh, bearish long term, and again would 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 mean a a complete regime change. Uh, it, it would lead to a growth uh, value, uh, you know, uh, re re rotation out of growth and into value. Uh, it would lead to a reduction of uh, you know, a ball selling and, and, and unpin, unpin the markets in a lot of ways. And I could go on and on, but I, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's so many assumptions built into current models. And, uh, you know, I think, I think understanding that the tails are now um, with the potential risks of a move away, you know, a move towards uh, a more inflationary environment uh, really opens the door for a completely different regime with com completely different uh, strategies. Mm. Um. 2020 has been weird already. We've had negative yielding sovereigns around the world. Oil futures traded negative at one point. All the other um, crazy things going on. The whole Broncos lineup is hurt. Uh, so we're, we're recording this, just time dating, September 23rd. Um, what do you think the chances as far as regimes, and this is more of a happy hour, coffee, gossip question, uh, do you think there's a very real possibility, no possibility, something in between for sovereign uh, bonds in the U.S. to go negative? Do you discount that as something that's, you know, no chance, like on the 10-year or probable? What's your, what's your thoughts? I think, I think it's highly likely. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, um, you know, I think, I think the Federal Reserve is going to be forced in the next downturn to do, uh, you know, exponentially greater things. I think, you know, they're going to have to uh, do yield curve control. Uh, they're going to have to, um, you know, the, the amount of leverage and the risks in the system at this point are, are such that um, on the next decline, you know, in order to prevent a secular decline again, um, they're going to have to roll out anything, you know, that they can. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't put it past buying stocks. I wouldn't put it past um, selling volatility products directly. I don't think anybody really talks about that. But I think, yeah. you know, those those are things that that ultimately, um, you know, look, can can they, you know, the, the, the don't fight the Fed thing is, you know, as, you know, it depend all that 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 matters is what limits are placed upon their ability to do things. Right now, they can't legally buy stocks, but Will Congress eventually give them that ability? Uh, if, if, if things are bad enough, maybe. Um, you know, but uh, I, I think things will get um, a lot weirder, um, a lot more upside down than you could ever possibly imagine, as is almost always the case. Um, I mean, that, yeah. that is definitely a non-consensus view that 2020 is going to get weirder than it already <laughs> is. This has been, I think, for many people, an entire decade fit into nine months. And by the way, we still have three months left. So the um, rest of the year, what does the world look like right now as far as vol strategies? I mean, normally this is the time of year when things start to get pretty jiggy. Uh, October through December, everyone seems to be back uh, from, from summertime in whatever sort of weird pandemic uh, normalcy they find themselves in. Any, uh, as we look to this year, any general uh, thoughts on what uh, the world looks like today and, and a few months into the future? Yeah, look, there are some uh, really um, crazy things going on in, on the volatility surface. Uh, historically, um, you have uh, a situation where um, long term, when I say long term, not really long, December, January vol during the election is, um, you know, given the, the fears of uh, contested election are uh, pricing at uh, dramatically higher than, than something we've ever seen. Um, the election uh, straddle, like the one day straddle for the election itself is only running at about $80, which is not that high, which, you know, given you know, $80 for the S&P 500. So, you know, we're talking two and a half percent. If anything, you ask me, that's cheap. Um, but behind that, they're pricing in uh, 110 to 115 dollar daily moves. Um, you know, which we're talking, you know, three and a half percent daily moves in the S&P throughout um, throughout December and January. 
um, those are dramatic moves. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, risk perceptions, especially given that, you know, there's a, a real possibility despite uh, common perception that, that one side wins outright, um, you know, and, and it isn't a contested election. Everybody just assumes it will be, um, you know, these, these vol levels out there are, are really high. And if you think about the fact that, um, you know, volatility being compressed, particularly in the indexes right now is what's been holding this market together. You're, you're seeing a lot of stress in pockets um, across the market, but it's really uh, moves are being compressed by index volatility being relative to realized. If you actually look at realized versus implied right now, they're almost right on top of each other. There's almost no risk premia in these uh, volatility markets. And that's just because they're very oversupplied currently and in the front of the curve. So yeah, my point here is at the end of the day, right now, risk premia compression is holding this market um, from anything dramatic happening. But if you look forward in post-election, that's not the case. That, that vol implied vol is priced incredibly high. And, and so imagine a situation where you have these pockets of uh, of risk starting to really blow out and now you no longer have risk premium. Um, that feedback loop, um, you know, calming the market, allowing it to, to function without uh, stress and instead being a tailwind that, that, can, that can promote a tail, um, a tailwind, I guess, uh, no pun intended, uh, you know, really. Yeah. Uh, well, and and what's, so that, what's the takeaway there? Is it, because um, there's a couple different uh, moving parts and, uh, and speak to your, you know, layman, your, uh, sure. uh, which I am, um, say, is it people are expecting a contested election won through their views in the um, derivative markets, which, by the way, it doesn't seem, I, I, I don't really do politics Twitter, but it doesn't seem like a consensus view. Maybe it is. Um, and then second, is there anything to take advantage of or avoid when it comes to you know, the next three months? Give us kind of the... Absolutely. I think that's, you know, great question. So this is, you know, again, time dating this is important, but really the last several days into this decline, um, you've seen, uh, you know, an interesting dynamic relative to recent history with uh, calendar spreads really expanding dramatically. Um, that is, um, that, that should um, continue based on where election ball is. Um, and given the compression, the feedback that I keep talking about uh, that's that's happening um, in the markets due to to low implied vol. Again, implied vol is very low. It's a, it's allowing people to hedge at relatively cheap costs, um, but uh, in the short term. But like I said, long term, that's not the case. Eventually, you're going to move away from the short term vol, right? And if you expand these calendar spreads, if you expand long term vega and make that really high and make the curve very steep, eventually over time. Uh, you're going to keep trending to higher and higher volatilities, and uh, eventually that pinning of the market, like I was saying, can can uh, can cause a uh, a disruption. You know, allowing of these other factors like credit spreads beginning to increase, which is happening the last couple of days. Um, you know, to really start taking over and, and risk to kind of um, you know snowball. Um, so things to take advantage of. I would I would uh, be positioning, and we are positioned to take advantage of. Um, you know, a volatile move uh, potentially uh, post-election. Um, there are great opportunities to do this for very low cost because there's a lot of uh, inefficiency in the, in the curve, a structural, structural inefficiency, not at 30 day per se, but because, um, because of these fears that are happening for a contested election, you have situations where February vol is, is very low relative to decent jam, as well as kind of November monthly election vol being really cheap. Um, you know, based on probabilities of a contested election, et cetera, you can really put on uh, structured fly trades, uh, trades in, uh, you know, uh, in the indexes versus um, kind of index uh, VIX ETNs and ETFs that can, that, that allow you to be long volatility while still, uh, you know, being, uh, collecting, kind of harvesting some of the extra, um, you know, what I, what we believe is, is mispriced um, volatility in, in, in that December to January period. Um, again, the key is to be long vol, position yourself for uh, a, a tail because I think it's likely to happen uh, some, something, you know, in that December, January period. Feet to the fire, gun to the head. Jim, what's the percent odds you're putting on a contested election? 
Um, I think it's over. I think, you know, if you look at what the market's pricing, the market's pricing in north of the uh, 65% chance. Um, I, Ooh, think, I think, lordy. which is crazy. Um, I agree with you. Um, is it a real risk? Absolutely. I, I don't want to dis be dismissive of it. I'm not saying go sell, you know, that ball in a vacuum. I'm actually saying the opposite. Be, be long uh, volatility for, for these events. Uh, position yourself to be able to take advantage of, of uh, you know, an increased likelihood of something happening just because implied volatilities are, are high during that period. Uh, and the, the more kind of structured risks that, it, that exist out there going forward with fiscal policy, et cetera. But in terms of specifically contested election risk, I believe it's high, uh, significantly high. You know, you have to also define what is a contested election? What does that look like? Is that something that gets resolved relatively quickly within a week? Are we taking this to December 14th, which is when the, the electoral college meets? Are you taking it to, uh, is, it a, is it a tie and you're taking it to January um, to a congressional vote? Um, you know, in, in Bush versus Gore, uh, Supreme Court settled uh, on December 12th because the Electoral College met the next day on December 13th. So you have to understand these dynamics, understand what's possible, what's not, what the odds are, what the magnitude of the move might be in those given environments and structure yourself accordingly. That's, that's a big part of, uh, of positioning and, and, and making your, you know, preparing for these situations is understanding event ball, not just, hey, what's high, what's low on the curve. It's really understanding uh, where is this thing being priced? Or where's the skew in this event being priced? And why is, is that efficient? There's a lot of uh, mispricing of skew that happens during event in event ball. And I won't get too wonky on that, but there's some, some things that are uh, some big opportunities in, in skew for events that you can take advantage of as well. And so, yeah, I think the odds, yeah, gun to my head, I would say the odds are 25%. Yeah, uh, well, you know it's interesting. Five and, and sixty-five. But we, um, uh, I was tweeting about this the other day because I was curious. Again, I try to mute just about every political uh, variation of phrases on on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, they still send to seep in, no matter what. Um, <laughs> it's inevitable. It, well, it's yeah. inevitable, but it's funny because you know I, I look back four years ago. I had a tweet where there's an academic paper, uh, you know, and it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it demonstrates like stock market has like an 85% accuracy in predicting the election just based on if it's up, I think the three months going into uh, the election. And I think the 12 months is similar. But I had tweeted uh, November 1st, last election, I said, Team Hillary better start buying futures because the stock market's down. And if it continues to be down, this, uh, you know, this, the simple indicator is if the stock market's up, incumbent party stays in, vice versa. Right. Anyway, um, but it's funny because this year, as of, you know, I think this, this podcast getting recorded, it's right at 50-50, which is right where the betting markets are. But so right. I was trying to assess, you know, where, what the probabilities are and at least try to place, place an actual bet on it. But most of the prediction markets only let you bet like 100 or I think, predict only caps out like 800 bucks or something but the rules they had which is a little different was i think december 4th was priced at about 10 to 1 um but their criteria for uh the determination was it when like fox and cnbc both called the election in favor of one person uh and i was like i'm not sure if that's as trustworthy or accurate as you know i would hope the bet would be anyway um listeners if you got any good ways to place this bet i'm curious because i think i think it's a, a pretty decent chance um given all the variables going in but uh uh anyway it'll be interesting to watch that's for sure i, I think an interesting way to play it is really you know without getting into too too deep is you know i think the value versus growth um, trade, which obviously has been a widow maker for years. Um, it's so stretched, I think, uh, and there's a, uh, there, there's secular reasons, like structural secular reasons why that trade, you know, in the next looking forward many years, I'm not talking one month, two months, uh, will, um, uh, will mean revert. And I, uh, just because of the need for greater fiscal, uh, stimulus and without getting into too much detail there, but, but clearly in a Biden victory, uh, that will happen quicker. Um, you know, the, the, the push for fiscal stimulus, infrastructure spending, um, you know, social, um, social programs um, will be much quicker um, 
based on the current zeitgeist and what people uh, you know, feel is necessary in the Democratic Party. And, and so I think one of the best ways to play this um, is to really kind of uh, look for ways to structure vault trades around that kind of value growth factor. And, um, and, and uh, I think there's some, you know, it might be, you might put yourself in a position where if Trump wins, uh, you may take a small loss on it, but I think the potential, um, you know, upside to a trade uh, that, that expresses that, and especially in a convex way, and a Biden victory could, could really pay dividends if that happens. So um, that's one place kind of we're, we're looking right now. Um, there's some interesting trades um, given, you know, where, where, where growth ball trades versus value ball. Um, and, uh, and so it's interesting. Uh, I, I never even thought about that from a derivative standpoint. I, I being a, uh, value guy at heart, um, as well as a trend follower and a long vol guy all mixed in, um, you know, the value community has just been facing that pain trade, uh, as you mentioned, and it seems to just keep getting worse by the day, but that's an interesting to, uh, thought, uh, I had not considered. So, um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. I mean, again, it's a it's a good kind of cheap way. I'd say be a very inexpensive way to to get a levered bet on, um, you know, on the election uh, outcome. Cool, um, Jim. A big picture question. Back up a second. Curious. You know, to the extent you guys do most of the vol arb just on S and P, is that accurate or? It's across all uh, indexes, but I'd say the flagship is S and P. I mean, that's kind of the center of the vol world. Uh, you you kind of have to normalize everything to that because that's where the, the greatest volume happens. So, uh, clearly, we've been having a lot more retail volume, uh, which we, we get into as well on the on on the big growth names, um, which you know has has changed that a little bit. But it's still the you know ten thousand pound gorilla. Uh, you know, it, it's still what ultimately pins and moves markets and relative value to that is kind of how you have to structure so we, yeah we trade we trade a, a lot of products but uh we, we, we do it through the lens of spx ball yeah because i mean i was thinking theoretically at least you know uh, the diversification across other markets whether it's fixed income commodities or just other uh financial markets in in equities would seem that there should be some broadly similar brush strokes across them although of course uh, we were talking Turkish stocks and, and investing before we got started. Um, there's clearly differences in, in different markets. Uh, is that something you would say is, is more accurate than not that, that, you know, the vol sort of concepts apply across markets or do you have to be pretty deep in the weeds aware of the structural differences or is it both? Look, yeah, absolutely. So different markets, uh, both equity, foreign equity markets, as well as just kind of debt markets, uh, you know, foreign exchange, uh, you know, commodities, um, you know, they all experience the risk premium compression dynamics that we've talked about, um, you know, particularly in interest rates. Uh, you know, I, the, but there are some dynamics that are very unique to equities, uh, you know, the obviously um, skew, uh, you know, one-sided skew in the equities um, and, and the way that skew uh, is uh, always uh, highest pretty much in the world and here in, uh, you know, domestically in S&P because this is where people come to hedge, um, really allow for some unique opportunities in equity land that, that don't translate over to uh, some of the other vol complexes. Um, but yeah, some, I, I guess the answer is, you know, in, in some ways like the universal kind of liquidity and compression issues are, you know, across all products. Um, they all are related, obviously, you know, the way you know, being an ex market maker, you know, I think of everything as, as a massive four dimensional matrix. Everything is related to everything. Every, you know, risk is, is filtered from one product to the other and has factor exposure across each factor relative to one another. Um, so, but there are certain things that, um, you know, can only be properly hedged, um, you know, in, in equity land for equities. And uh, I think, you know, that's why um, I think this complex, both in terms of opportunities for relative value, convexity trades, um, it, you know, as we saw in, in March, actually March, the best performing vol was S&P vol, uh, equity vol. Um, you know, it, 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 you know it, you're allowed opportunities here that you wouldn't get elsewhere and outperformance. 
I also think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you take on too much correlation basis risk, um, you know, on a long vol trade and you're trying to get relative value opportunities, but capture a tail and the tail basis can, can really eat you up. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, especially given this li liquidity environment and the potential liquidity issues that, that arise into these moves more and more with kind of unmatched tail liquidity um, out there. So I think it's critical if you're, if you're really focused on um, performing in the tail to not put too much basis risk on, on the books. Um, so we really try and uh, really try and not get too cute with some of the strategies and really take advantage of, um, of you know, uh, strategies that, that don't have as much basis risk. What's the um, impact, if any? Uh, we've certainly seen similarities to other times, but you know, the media loves to cover all the shenanigans going on in Robin Hood and Portnoy, not ours, the other one. Um, <laughs> the uh, shout out. Uh, <laughs> be glad to get the shout out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Masasan or all these other things that may be going on. Are these um, having an impact? Is it something that's kind of, you know, you brush aside as minor players or minor effects? Are they creating opportunity? Um, any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, uh, anybody who's been kind of following me on Twitter for the last three months would kind of see, um, you know, kind of the ability to uh, call market direction based on these volatility factors and how um, how important they are to understanding kind of uh, um, structural realities to how this market works. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about is kind of gamma effects from these indexes, from these uh, from these ball products. And uh, the thing let's talk about it. What does it, what does that, what does that mean? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about it in the last month or so, but you know, essentially all this retail buying of calls, it was actually much more uh, the retail buying of calls than it was uh, Masasan and, you know, SoftBank, uh, but they also played a role, but all that buying of, of calls, um, you know, uh, face forces dealers to take short, gamma positions, you know, in those, in those stocks, which is, you know, only increasing leverage in the direction of the trade. So with all those calls being bought, uh, dealers were forced, uh, you know, shorter and shorter Delta into that rally uh, that have, you know, that was, you know, that ended in at the end of August. And uh, that, that ultimately led to a situation where, you know, there was greater and greater stock buyback, uh, raising of balls into a rally, which was very unique, the extent to which the VIX and ball was rising. Um, and really necessitated um, kind of an unpinning again uh, of, of, as we were talking about before, of the vol complex and allowing for some of these other risks and factors to kind of ultimately push the market down. Um, you know, in, in late August, I was very public about kind of when you see volatility rising into a rally, uh, it's just a matter of time because that, that, you know, especially in this market, which is liquidity driven, uh, you know, it's an un, again, an unpinning for lack of a better term um, of, of the, the forces that have largely been at play um, that, that have allowed this market and, and growth in particular to, to, um, to outperform. And so when that ball rises in a situation like that, it really uh, loosened the market and allowed it to, to decline. That having been said, the sophisticated players know this now at this point. Um, you know, as dealers were, were forced to take on shorter and shorter gamma in these products, they were hedging it net long ball. Uh, by buying, you know, uh, calls and, and puts both in the S&P 500 and across the rest of the vol complex. So the positioning really got to a point at the top where people were long vol in, uh, you know, in the S&P and across uh, the non-growth names uh, and short it in those growth names. Um, and they were extra long vol. So uh, not surprisingly, you know, the pain trade is always where the market tends to go. Uh, and the pain trade was for for growth to rotate out, I publicly called for a rotation out of growth at that point, and a massive rotation out of growth and into, into value uh, beginning when that started happening. Um, and you had a compression of volatility into a drop because people were extra long index volatility. So, uh, you know, we had a massive decline in the market, which was again, not a surprise. We got a vol compression uh, broadly in the market, which is not a surprise as you move away from the short calls that people had and the dealers had in the NASDAQ. And you had a massive decline in um, that 
uh, those growth names, um, you know, and that rotation happens. So all, this is the beauty of understanding vol markets. It's, it's, it's multidimensional. You not only get to color on which way will the market go based on these dynamics, but what will vol do likely, you know, where's the pain trade in vol? Where's the pain, pain trade in the market? Where's the pain trade in, in um, you know, in, in a um, dispersion trade, you know, the growth versus, you know, where's the rotation likely to happen? All these things, uh, you know, where, where does it, in terms of time, uh, you know, where is, when, is, when are things likely to happen and, and how are they likely to play out based on gamma and VANA flows that will occur during this time? You know, the more you understand these vol markets and where the supply and demand imbalances are and how the, the street is, is positioned, the more you understand uh, not just where the market will go, but, but where, um, you know, and how the dynamics will play out, um, you know, in, in the months, weeks, months to come. Um, so. Well, it's going to be fun to watch. That's for sure. Not going to be boring, uh, no matter what. Um, as we look past the horizon and we start to wind this down, any general thoughts on, um, you know, you talked a lot about instability, but uh, any other just general thoughts on markets, your firm, what's y'all's plans over the next, uh, the next decade, or I should say the rest of this decade, 2020 should have its own like separate year, or the rest of the decade. Uh, any, any, what, or what are you excited about? Anything on your mind, you're researching, studying, thinking about? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the business, uh, I kind of mentioned this before, but my, I've really started to focus a lot more on um, kind of uh, the vol effects um, on the market itself. We've done a lot more kind of analysis to that effect, and we have a proprietary strategy that has been very successful in the last year since we've launched it, um, using these vol effects to predict um, kind of market movements. Um, you know, that's an area I think uh, that is not as, um, you know, there's not as much capital in it, not as many people understand those effects as well as, you know, as we do uh, based on our experience. And, uh, you know, measuring these supply and demand factors uh, is really the, the kind of secret sauce and, and being able to, to, to predict markets ahead of time. Um, it's hard to measure those that supply and demand. You have to be on the inside. You have to have good information. You have to track flows, um, and and you have to have a, a good framework to take advantage of it. But that's that's an area I'm trying to focus more on and, and more directional um, vol. Um, you know, we've we've really been good at the vol arb piece and kind of drawing distributions and understanding where vol is cheap and expensive and how to take advantage of it for a long time. But adding the directional. Uh, expertise in really the last year has been uh, has been a revelation, and, and I think you know obviously much more scalable strategy than than some of the vol arb strategies are as well, which is a big benefit for us as a firm. So we're we're going to probably launch a product, a CTA product that that based on our performance uh, on, on that end uh, under kind of a different moniker, Kai Volatility Advisors, um, in the next uh, six months. What's, so. what's the sort of capacity for the vol arb? I mean, you're trading in a pretty big pond. Is it really high or is it actually not that high? It's, uh, it's less than you think. Um, you know, you think S&P 500 vol is a incredibly deep pool and, you know, um, but, uh, you know, the key is if you're dealing with the tail, like I said before, you know, to get the liquidity during times of stress, that mismatch liquidity uh, based on, you know, you know, the amount of, I mean, imagine people are across the street are short five delta, 10 delta puts, uh, that when you get down there become a hundred delta, um, you know, these are already leveraged positions, um, you know, and everybody's trying to get out at the same time. So, um, you know, the liquidity in these situations we've seen it time and time again, the last five years um, is not there in those situations. Um, so that really limits some of the, despite being on the long side, right? There's still only so much, um, you know, you can, you can do uh, the capacity of our long ball strategy is, is around $500 million. Um, you know, and we're, we're managing about half of that now. Um, so not as much as you'd, uh, you'd expect. Um, that's also a great, you know, reason for us to, to really try and benefit from some of the, uh, the, the alpha and edge that we get from understanding these markets in the, in, in the much deeper equity markets. All right, listeners, you got to get your wires in before uh, Jim closes on you, <laughs> before the election. Um, what's been uh, the most memorable, you could say, investment or trade during uh, your career? It could be good, bad, long, short, in between. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I made the majority of my net worth in, 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 in 2008. 
um, during the financial crisis. That's kind of when I made my name, when I, when I uh, really kind of developed a lot of these strategies that I, um, that I now use. Um, and, and a lot of the things we still do in the long vols, on the long vol strategy are, um, you know, are lessons learned from that experience. Um, we, you know, it, it, maybe, you know, what I believe is a, an oncoming, uh, you know, separate, you know, different but similar uh, experience, uh, you know, in the next year to, um, you know, will be better. But until, until uh, that, until and if that, you know, materializes, uh, you know, I have to hang my hat on that. That was the best trade I've ever made. You know, we took uh, what was a couple million dollars and, and turned it to, to north of 35 um, in a matter of a couple of years. Um, you know, there are, those aren't big numbers that, that you know, some of your, that compared to some of your guests. And again, not a scalable strategies, but but the risk reward on those these types of positions that you can uh, put out there, um, uh, you know, are incredible if you get a secular decline, and that's that's really the key. And again, like you mentioned at the top of the program, those, those haven't happened uh, really since uh, 08. and you know, um, and the the window is definitely opening for them with higher if we do get higher uh, inflation. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I think that. I won't get into the details of the trade, but again, it's, it's very related to some of the things I talked about in terms of how we position and take advantage of uh, the kind of structural inefficiencies in the indexes and, and position ourselves long haul. Well, the, the takeaway is you only have to show up once every 10 years. You just go to, uh, take a vacation <laughs> right. once a decade, have a, a month or two of work. Oh, I wish I knew monetize that. Monetize it I... and go, go back to bed. Uh, the amount of, amount of like uh, brain cells I've killed in the last, uh, you know, 11 years trying to, um, you know, wait for that coming is, uh, you know, <laughs> I wish, I, I wish I stayed uh, on break longer than a year and a half. I'll tell you that. But uh. yeah. <laughs> what, uh, well, well, good, Jim, we're going to have to hit you up next time. We, we want some, uh, deep due diligence on Turkey as well as, uh, what's going on. We'll have to revisit and see kind of how this year ended. Uh, I imagine it's going to be a totally we'll peaceful to. next three months. The virus is going to disappear into the ether. Uh, peaceful political transition and then back to business as normal in 2021. I, I, I'd love to come back. I will say the one thing I didn't mention, I don't, I don't mean to just be all fear mongering. Uh, you know, I, I do think when people are expecting something uh, in terms of an actual expiration time, like we are seeing in December, January, right? Uh, the, unlike the, you know, the theory that, that like you mentioned, uh, that, that the intelligence of, of crowds existing there is that because there's a feedback loop in ball markets, a lot of times there's structural reasons why the events actually don't um, fully play out at that time, right? Because mm -hmm. um, as ball compresses after the event, uh, you'll get, you know, similar to, to what you got in, uh, in the Trump election in 16, you could get a really kind of uh, short-term period of stabilization. So I wouldn't be surprised if we get some initial volatility and then, uh, you know, it amounts to some type of compression and towards the end of the year only to come back, um, you know, uh, after uh, the new year or something, uh, some, you know, into, into spring of next year. So that's my general framework. I would say, who knows, we'll see again, uh, we're positioned long ball for the event, but I do think that there's a better chance we get some movement on the election in November, maybe some stabilization in December, January, um, once we, we all know who the next president is, and then, um, and then when, when the, the whole idea of you know, growing fiscal um, uh, policy as well as potential inflation, depending on who's, who's, uh, who's elected president, I think we could see a real beginning of a secular move into next year. I think, and we didn't really touch on this, and it's getting too late to go deep, but you know, I think a undercurrent of a lot of discussions I'm having with advisors who are more and more consistently getting concerned about where bonds are in the portfolio with bonds yielding 60 basis points um, and the potential if they do go to zero or negative, what other strategies can they sub in that have some sort of protection to the rest of the portfolio? So going from 60-40 to maybe 80-20 or 70 uh, 2010 and that 10 being something like a strategy you're talking about that hedges some of the equity but doesn't give you the negative carry bonds i don't know that's for next time we'll talk about that <laughs> we'll talk about that next time always leave the audience wanting more jim otherwise we're 
this is going to start to be a Rogan ask link long podcast well, i definitely think this should be part of the uh anybody's portfolio i think the the convexity mismatch given the leverage is uh represents a real opportunity obviously but uh, i'm talking my book so we'll leave it for next and time I, all right perfect where do people go they want to find you uh I, twitter handle website all that good stuff yeah twitter handles jam underscore croissant uh i just wanted to hear you say it we always put it in the show notes i just wanted to hear you mention the twitter handle yeah, obviously my name Jem Carson, and people most people mm -hmm. see it spelled, they don't understand. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of been a nickname for a little while. So Jam uh, Jam underscore Croissant uh, website is uh, geocapital.com. We're we are in the process of, uh, like I said, uh, launching a CTA product uh, under the moniker Kai Volatility Advisors, um, and that uh, that website will be it will be live here shortly as well, and and something that uh, you you can hope to hear a, a lot more about in the coming months. Awesome, Jim. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Ned.